Hello and welcome to the Science Set Free podcast with myself, Mark Vernon, and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi Rupert. Hello Mark. Rupert, I wondered today whether we might talk about celebrity gurus, for want of a better expression, because I feel that this year, coming out of the last two or three years, but suddenly this year, we're surrounded by public intellectuals who are getting a massive hearing. Um, you know, they're, they're sort of becoming semi-famous, um, some, you know, perhaps already were famous, but they're writing about big ideas, big world views, taking on what traditionally would have been big religious or spiritual questions, giving them different inflections, but they seem to be getting a huge traction right now. So I'm thinking of people like Jordan Peterson, um, Yuval Noah Harari, um, Russell Brand, um, you know, these big uh, figures that get huge podcast downloads, huge book sales. I mean, I just wondered whether it were worth talking what's going on, as well as, you know, what we make of them, these different figures as well. Oh, I'd love to talk about that. I mean, I myself am very struck by this. And, you know, until recently, I hardly ever listened to YouTubes um, or podcasts. But um, in the last few months, I've become fascinated by these, um, the podcasts by Jordan Peterson and, and Harari. And, of course, Russell Brand, I did one with him myself, uh, and I've been listening to some of his other ones. And they have a huge following, a huge impact. I'm always hearing about them from people, especially younger people. I mean, have you noticed from following your uh, podcast with Russell Brand, there's a definite impact there? I mean, you're, you're, you, you are not unused to, to making a few waves and, and getting impact and mm-hmm. having people be in touch and so on. But you've noticed there's something going on with Russell Brand. Oh, huge. I mean, I would say uh, in, in relation to my new book, Science and Spiritual Practices, the thing with Russell Brand is by far the biggest. I mean, the the number of downloads of the podcast and YouTube videos together make up probably around three quarters of a million. Um, You know, compared with books which sell a few thousand, um, this is enormous. And I get lots of emails uh, from people who've seen the YouTube or heard the podcast and a lot of feedback from it, generally very positive. Yeah, so my sense with Russell Brand, tell me whether this is your sense, my sense <clears throat> with Russell Brand is that he, he's not so much purporting to have a world view, but he's very smart in his um, wit and very well read as well. And he's really good at like honing in on big figures, you know, um, people like Brian Cox, who he's had on as well, um, and driving at the sort of the spiritual side of things and drawing that out. Um, I mean, do you think that's a fair a fair summary, a fair take? Well, I think so. I mean, he does have a particular message of his own, but it's not a particularly original one. His book, Recovery, Freedom from Our Addictions, which I've read, is about the 12-step program. Um, and <clears throat> that's based on his own experience of recovering from heroin and alcohol and sex addictions. Um and the point he makes there is that it's not where are you an addict or not, but where on the addiction scale are you? Is it just Facebook? Is it online videos? Is it pornography? Is it gambling? You know, there's a whole range of uh, consumerism. Um, so he does have a particular message there, but in his podcast, um, I think he really wants to hear what other people are saying. And the way he interacts with people, I think, is extraordinarily interesting because he's incredibly quick. He's very clever. Uh, He's very quick at getting the point that someone's making and summarising it, making it more accessible than it was before. And also uh, expressing his own view, which is basically that there is a spiritual reality. Um, It's not just genes and molecules and consumerism and... Uh, electric impulses in brains there's a lot more going on he's not an atheist or a materialist and I think that that uh, uh, the way he interacts with various people he talks to in the, in the YouTubes I've watched is very stimulating I mean it's gripping stuff to, to, to watch this and he's, I guess that he's sort of normalising the spiritual world view if the materialist worldview has been the dominant one, he's someone who's saying, look, we can talk about it this way too, and here's the language, here's how to do it. 
It needn't yes. be embarrassing. Um, it, you know, it can actually be pretty short and sharp and to the point, in fact. Yes, and in fact, more common sense and makes more sense of life than, than, than the other the materialist or atheist point of view. I think he's doing a very brilliant job in, in, in these podcasts, and you never know what's going to happen next. So it's not as if he's trying to put across a preachy message. He's, I think, a genuine spiritual inquirer and just wants to know what's going on in the intellectual world and is very good at finding out and making it, opening it up to lots of people. So that's sort of one way that it's being done with Russell Brandt. Should we move on to a couple of the other people that oh, I mentioned at the top? Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, let's focus on Jordan Peterson because he feels a very different phenomenon. He's definitely a phenomenon, my goodness. You know, his book is number one in Amazon and he gets lots of downloads and so on as well. Um, but I find myself more wary of him and I, I, I'm not completely sure why, if I'm honest. It's something as much about his style as anything. I mean, I've tried to formulate a few critiques about the way he uses Jung, for example, which I know a little bit about myself, um, uh, his use of um, biology and the way that he mixes biology and morality and spirituality, which I feel a bit wary of too. Um, but I, I do feel a bit, um, uh, I don't know, sort of slightly, uh, is it bamboozled or something sort of stirs up when I listen to him that, that feels uh, unsettling and um, slightly dark, actually, even. Really? Um, well, the things I've listened to by him have, have struck me. First of all, he comes across as unbelievably articulate. I mean, he's able to argue any point. Uh, and he is, he's an arguer. He's, Russell Brand is, is not so much an arguer or debater. Uh, uh, Jordan Peterson's very good in the kind of debate format. Well, now, uh, let, let, maybe I can leap in immediately, because, you see, I, I, I've listened to some of the, the lectures and so on, and... Um, Maybe part of my frustration is that I feel you listen for about five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, sort of waiting for the point. And I'm not quite sure that it ever sometimes really emerges. Um, and so I think he's very fluent with a lot of different words and ideas and traditions. Um, but I, I guess I'm not quite sure what it all adds up to when I listen to him. Well, I agree. I think that, that it's, it's, it's plausible. He's very good at arguing against things. Um, the famous Channel 4 YouTube interview, um, where he's interviewed by an interviewer, a woman who's rather aggressive about women's pay and women's rights and that kind of thing. He's very good at arguing against a kind of standard arguments and standard conventional wisdom that she was putting forward. Um, well, what he's arguing for, I agree, is much more obscure. He seems to be arguing for um, a view of seeing things as stories. Uh, the, the importance of biblical stories, for example, is a big theme with him. I, I like that because most people have no idea what biblical stories are. And so putting biblical stories back into uh, the you know, popular discourse, it seems to me a good thing to do. Um, He's also arguing uh, for a positive role of male activity and, and manliness and being male, as opposed to a kind of tide of feminist uh, thinking that leaves a lot of men disoriented. I mean, everything, it's as if a lot of this, uh, the impression a lot of men get, sometimes I get myself, is as if testosterone is some kind of systemic poison, that men are, all, uh, are suffering from testosterone poisoning. Um, well, that's not a very good way of feeling about yourself if you're a man. And so I think uh, part of his appeal is, is through a more positive view of being male. Um, but when it comes to the most fundamental questions, he's very evasive. Uh, and Russell Brown's very clear, I believe in God. And then he'll say what he means by that. It's to do with love and it's to do with an inclusiveness of, and wholeness of things. Whereas... Um, Peterson's much more obscure on points like that. Is it just a story he's talking about? Is it just a way, an archetypal pattern he's interested in? It's much more obscure. So I think there's a lot more you say there. Um, the, 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 the sort of first point about you know men and women and the masculine and the feminine and so on. Um, I mean, I, I watched the Kathy Newman Channel 4 interview as well. Mm. And... Um, uh, 
it was, you know, kind of a rock hits a hard place uh, often. Mm. Uh, and in a way, um, although if Kathy Newman was sort of hammering away at one point, Jordan Peterson was just falling back constantly on empirical facts, um, you know, which I don't even know quite how true they are. This is another mm. accusation that's made against him. He often presents a bit of evidence. Um, I mean, I'm very aware that, for example, the whole of psychology has been thrown into disarray because of the verification crisis. Yes. I mean, you know, that all these experiments which uh, psychology has been founded upon, um, we've talked about this before, you know, yes. are kind of are being severely questioned because they can't be replicated. Um, so it, it did feel a bit like rock and hard place. And uh, but the, perhaps a more subtle critique is is uh, goes into the Jungian side of it. You know, because he will talk about masculine archetypes and feminine archetypes, and as you say, sort of presenting a version of what it is to be male that um, has a certain kind of appeal. I, I mean, it makes me a bit nervous too, because of course it does appeal to a deeply unsavoury alt-right kind of masculinity as well, which you know, mm. as, as a gay person, I find very. Uh, unpleasant and feel very mm. wary of um, but um, I think that perhaps the reason why it does appeal to the, that, that more extreme version of masculinity um, is that he's very binary about things it's like it often feels he's saying it's male or female and certainly in Jung there are, you can read Jung in that way and he lived in a pretty mm. binary world you know a hundred years ago I always remember reading once with Jung that um, it would have been taboo for him to do more than shake his hand with his wife in public. You know, that's how binary Swiss society mm. was at the turn of the century. Um, but Jungian since um, are much more fluid um, about archetypes now. They're much more polytheistic, is a kind of Jungian way of putting it yes. now. Um, so it's not just about masculinity and femity, femininity, it's about, you know, poor and senex two versions of what it is to be a man or it's about um you know old crone and a uh, young you know, beauty um mm. feminine archetypes and these things can mix up much more fluidly in modern jungianism now mm. and i just don't get any of that sense with jordison with jordan peterson at all no no i agree it's rather binary and his argument has this kind of bludgeoning effect through invoking facts. You know, recent surveys show that the d determinants of success and so on are this and that. You know, uh, things that people haven't read and can't critique. They ha you, you, take, you have to take it or leave it. You have to take his word for it. And he speaks with the authority of a university professor and someone who's done all this studying and so on. So uh, th th that bit of it comes across as rather bullying to me. I mean, it's sort of, it, it has that aspect to it. I mean, I like the fact that he makes points strongly, uh, that he's not kind of apologetic about his point of view. But uh, I, I think, it, like, the point, as we just said, you know, the main thing is that what's he really standing for? If you take him seriously, what is it all really about? Um, it's about a way of behaving. His book is about how to behave in the world and you know, how to act in the world um, but what's the deep belief system that's obscure now in the case of Yuval Noah Harari it's not so obscure I mean he's he has all sorts of insights and points of view in him. I've read Homo Deus I think you've read yes yeah, so I've read Sapiens yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, good well in between us we <laughs> covered most of it um with him, I, I find that um, his bleak point of view, I find his point of view extremely bleak, um, and he doesn't come across to me as a very likable character. Um, he seems to be above everything. You know, everything anyone believes, he's got a story about it, and then he'll tell you it's just a story. And so he somehow stands outside all these stories as if he's risen above them all and somehow is external to all these belief systems that everyone else is trapped in. So that doesn't come across to me as a very attractive point of view. Um, but what he does believe is what science says. He more or less swallows whole the materialist scientific story. You know, uh, we are our brains, and uh, we are brain activity, and genes can all be edited and cloned, and scientists looking inside the brain have never found the soul, um, uh, the free will doesn't exist because if you study brain activity you always find causes in the brain or randomness and neither of those are free will um, he swallows whole the kind of standard materialist view in science 
on the other hand, um, I find the way he expresses things is often quite clear and interesting and original and clearly shows that he thought about things himself. He's not just cutting and pasting other people's opinions in most of his writing. In some places he is, particularly the scientific bits. But um, in a lot of his other views on history and and, um, society, it seems to me there are fresh insights. And I was trying to think how that could be, how he could think in such an original way about so many things. I mean, the end product isn't very original, but the way he expresses it, and and there are flashes of insight throughout. Um, Then what came to me then was that this clearly shows he's been thinking about all these things, not just reading them and writing them down. And then I thought, well, the closest analogy in my own experiences comes from meditation, that sometimes when I'm meditating, I'm concentrating on my mantra, and um, then flashes come into my mind uh, about things I'm thinking about or writing about, often quite unexpected flashes, and uh, then I go on with my mantra and so on. But a lot of, uh, I also spend quite a lot of time just thinking. I sort of pay something down or walk on Hempstead Heath thinking for quite long periods. Um, and it seemed to me that a lot of his uh, thing, it was like the kind of things that come to me when I meditate. I then later, just the next day, uh, watched uh, the Russell Brand talk with him where he revealed that he meditates two hours a day, in morning and the evening, and and actually says, I could never have written this book if I didn't meditate. So, although his meditation isn't primarily focused on what he's writing in the book, I'm sure that that is one of the windows through which these kind of original ways of putting things come to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I enjoy the broad sweep too, you know, there's something thrilling about picking up a book that's going to start, as it were, from the year dot and sort of carry you all the way through, Mm. and that, 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 which is what Sapiens does, and that is is, uh, sort of, there's a thrill in that. But, it, it constantly inegled me, you know, because the sort of parallel experience I had to your, he adopts a standard materialist view, is that very early on in Sapiens, he says, you know, the genius of human beings, the thing that gave our, our evolutionary advantage was language. And he defines language as the, as the ability to spread pure fictions. Um, and these pure fictions have adaptive advantage because they bond large groups of people together and so on. But he doesn't make the obvious step is, well, why is his scientific view not just pure fiction too? You know, why isn't technology just the way that our society happens to be uh, bound together now in large numbers? Um, and, you know, he, he doesn't address that. And, and, and when you say he has this slight, there's this slight sense of him standing above and outside of it all, I guess that's how he pulls off the trick because he never quite questions himself. Um, and applies, as it were, his his fictional critique um, to what he his own stance. Um, well, in that uh, case, he uh, I mean, I, I get the same impression, and in that sense, he's very like standard atheists. Um, standard atheists of the kind of Daniel Dennett type or the Dawkins type um, critique religious worldviews as fictions that other people need for consolation, or they're manipulated into believing this by controlling priests or power systems etc um, but they, they then take the point, we now know that this is just things going on in the brain etc, they never criticise their own point of view and what they can't get is that their materialist atheist worldview is itself a belief system they don't get that, they think somehow they've stepped outside belief systems and from having stepped outside them they think they can prove that free will's an illusion but then why on earth should anyone believe what they say? Because they're just saying, because their brain makes them say it. And why should they persuade me freely to adopt uh, their point of view when I haven't got any free will? They, they may just think they can bludgeon my nerve cells into agreeing with them by some kind of neuronal bullying or something. Um, so I, I think this is a common vice of people who have bought into the atheist worldview. And I think it comes across in the felt sense, which you mentioned there as well, the sort of bleakness, because he he won't countenance at all the idea that maybe this human story is a kind of unfolding of soul or an unfolding of spirit, you know, something that's felt and that's engaged and connected with a deeper reality. And so it does give it this slightly mechanistic, plodding, adaptive, 
random, directionless sort of sense. And now the machine's about to take over and there's sort of nothing we can do about it. Well, he's completely detached from the soul level of reality, it seems to me. Yes. Well, in fact, he argues that the soul doesn't exist. In Homo Deus, he, he says, you know, scientists have spent years studying the brain. They've never found the soul. And um, everything in evolution... Uh, changes and evolves the idea of a changeless soul enduring eternally doesn't fit with evolution therefore it's just one of these stories or fictions I mean in a few pages he just dismisses everything to do with the soul in what seemed to me very meretricious shallow arguments Uh, but uh, one of his strengths though is that he does admit that the scientific worldview has no explanation for consciousness and he is interested in consciousness, and I suppose partly because he spends so much time meditating. Homo Deus is dedicated to Goenka, the great Vipassana teacher. Um, and that was a surprise when I picked up the book, I, the very first page, dedicated to my teacher, Goenka. Um, so he does have a much more nuanced sense of consciousness than, than um, most atheists do. Um, He fits in the category of atheists who meditate, which includes people like Sam Harris and Susan Blackmore. Um, In in a way, it's a more interesting category of atheism than um, old-style, old-school Dawkins-Dennett-type atheism, because it admits that there's a direct experience of consciousness, but he interprets it in a Buddhist sense of there's no consistent self, there's just a, a whole series of thought patterns flowing through the mind and there's no consistent basis to any of this. And it's a very stark, kind of ascetic, rather brutal sort of Buddhism, I think, that informs that. Um, you know, it's uh, it's sort of, it, it, it's, it's the kind of Buddhism that rushes very quickly to the notion of no self, but instead of really understanding what this business of no self is about, it just sort of takes it as um, blasting any notion that you might have of yourself, of your free will, of your engagement with nature. It's all just a kind of delusion and, and doesn't really seem to progress much beyond um, the idea that everything's a delusion. You just, as it were, in your meditation, sit and watch this delusion pass before your eyes yes. and don't really seem to take it any further. So in a funny sort of way, although um, it's, it's, it's placing itself within a Buddhist camp, it's also ignoring, to my mind, the majority of the, of the Buddhist tradition, which has said something far more interesting about notions of no self, which would be something like the bit of the self that we identify with has this transient rising and falling quality, um, but the knower of the known... Um, sits in a completely different, timeless, deathless, are these the kind of words which you use, that kind of space. They just don't seem to go there at all. No, because as a materialist and an atheist, he's just talking about brain processes. And it's a, a secular Buddhist position that we've talked about before. Um, and so I think that that's a serious limitation. And I think on the whole, his influence is probably a bad influence because it's putting across a very depressing view of humanity um, as if you can move outside it into this intellectual position of detachment and this Buddhist, uh, this kind of secular meditation view of detachment and um, somehow it all goes on but it's all fairly meaningless and um, I think that's a really bad message and I think it's also untrue because I think it's based on taking for granted the materialist dogmatic materialist world view or belief system um, and dressing it up in quite an attractive and interesting way in this enormous narrative um, and making many people who read it think that this is some deep insight into the human condition. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with that. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a risk um, that it, as much as a, as a product of the publishing industry as anything else, actually, that I, my sense, you know, ha- having a little bit to do with publishing in a, often a rather frustrated way, but nonetheless a little bit, um, is that um, their worldview fits into the worldview that editors understand, um, that publishers understand. Um, so their be- books get, as it were, adopted, they get the big push. Now, you know, I'm not saying they're not good writers. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about Jordan Peterson, actually. But nonetheless, I think Harari is a good writer. Um, I'm, I don't want to knock that. Um, but nonetheless, their worldview, as it were, resonates or can chime with the publishing worldview. So before you know what's happened, they're stacked at the front of Waterstones. They become a kind of self-fulfilling publishing phenomena. Um, but people on the street, 
Um, my worry is that, and, I, and sometimes you know, I hear this directly from people, as they pick up a book which is a big idea, as you say, they feel slightly bludgeoned by it because mm. they they themselves haven't you know read uh, more widely or um, they sort of feel it's such a total kind of story that's been presented to them that they've got to sort of buy it um, because they, if they don't, they don't know quite where else to go. Mm. And so, you know, the net effect of these celebrity gurus, um, well, not Russell Brand so much, we perhaps decided something a bit different about him, but yes. certainly Peterson and Harari um, is, uh, well, it would be very interesting where it actually leaves people when they, you know, bought these books. Where are they actually left after this yes. um, experience? Well, that's an empirical question. It would be very interesting to find out. Um, Good. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad we've had a chance to talk about them because, you know, they, they are a big phenomenon in many people's lives, including your life and my life, because, you know, I found it fascinating to watch these talks and hear what they have to say and read what they have to say. And I think it's, sort of, you know, hopefully, you know, something which we're trying to do, as we've said, Russell Brand is trying to do, partly it's uh, trying to just generate a sort of language, a discourse, a kind of rhetoric that actually makes another worldview possible to talk about um, yes. and not just uh, the dominant materialism um, as well but one good thing one can say for all this celebrity guru phenomenon is that they're talking about big ideas and big pictures and in a world which is obsessed with trivia you know the latest instagram picture of, of someone having their hair cut or something i mean um it, it's it's rather good that the the big picture the which the academic world doesn't deal in. The academic world doesn't deal in big pictures. It deals in specialised nuggets or fractions of knowledge. It divided up into lots of disciplines and sub-disciplines. It doesn't give you a big picture. That's totally out of fashion in the academic world. Um, and it's left this enormous void in our culture. And that void is being filled by celebrity gurus. And I think the fact that they're there and that they're, they're so, they are celebrities is a very interesting cultural phenomenon. I do. I, I can see that completely. Actually, the void. Yeah, um, that uh, um, you know, things like historicism. Uh, uh, you know, bad words um, mm. in in the humanities. Um, you know, science uh, is very much about um, you know drilling down into particular findings and so on, which are interesting in themselves. But quite how it joins up. Actually, we could. This this would be another podcast now. But has been a problem with modern science, hasn't it? What what it all sort of adds up to with a bigger worldview. You get this kind of default methodology, default materialism, but yes. it leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Yes. Um, so at least these guys are trying to ans answer bigger questions. And and I think that's a very healthy symptom. Yeah, yeah. We should we should take that from them, even if we don't agree with them. That big exactly. questions are worth asking. I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Cheers.